In 1808, four companies of the 2nd Battalion, to which I belonged, were ordered to Portugal. In that year, I first saw the French. Being immediately pushed forwards up the country in advance of the main body, many of us in this hot climate very soon began to find out the misery of the frightful load we were condemned to march and fight under, with the burning sun above our heads and our feet sinking every step into the hot sand. Though the peasantry sent into our camp a great quantity of the good things of their country, so that our men regaled themselves upon oranges, grapes, melons and figs, and we had an abundance of delicacies which many of us had never before tasted. Among other presents, a live calf was presented to the rifles, so that altogether we feasted in our first entrance into Portugal like a company of aldermen. The next day we again advanced, and being in a state of the utmost anxiety to come up against the French, neither the heat of the burning sun, long miles or heavy knapsacks were able to diminish our ardour. Indeed, I often look back with wonder at the light-hearted style, the jollity and reckless indifference with which men who were destined in so short a time to fall hurried onwards to the field of strife, seemingly without a thought of anything but the sheer love of meeting the foe and the excitement of the battle. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, the online learning platform. Skillshare is a great resource that I've been using to brush up on my editing and general business skills. One example that has had a huge effect on voices of the past was the session Creative Video Storytelling and Editing, Making the Most of Stock Footage by Nikki Stevens. With the quarantine over the last year, using stock footage effectively has been an absolute lifesaver for a lot of the videos from the History Brothers. And that's Skillshare. Whether you're a professional or just starting out, it's a great resource for self-improvement. And to start you off, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity and make the most of 2021. Thanks. On the 17th, being still in front, we came up with the French. And I remember observing the pleasing effect afforded by the sun's rays glancing upon their arms as they formed in order of battle to receive us. Moving on in extended order, under whatever cover the nature of the ground afforded, we began a sharp fire upon them, and thus commenced the Battle of Rolisa. I do not pretend to give a description of this or any other battle I have been present at. All I can do is to tell the things which happened immediately around me, and that, I think, is as much as a private soldier can be expected to do. The rifles indeed fought well this day, and we lost many men. They seemed in high spirits and delighted at having driven the enemy before them. Joseph Cochran was by my side loading and firing very industriously about this period of the day. Thirsting with heat in action, he lifted his canteen to his mouth. Here's to you, old boy, he said, as he took a pull of its contents. As he did so, a bullet went through the canteen, and perforating his brain killed him in a moment. Another man fell close to him almost immediately, struck by a ball in the thigh. Indeed, we caught it severely just here, and saw a man named Simmons struck full in the face by a round shot, and he came to the ground, a headless trunk. A man near me uttered a scream of agony, and looking from the 29th, who were on my right, to the left from whence the screech had come, I saw one of our sergeants, named Fraser, sitting in a doubled up position and swaying backwards and forwards, as though he had got a terrible pain in his bowels. He continued to make so much complaint that I arose and went to him, for he was rather a crony of mine. Oh, Harris, said he, as I took him in my arms, I shall die, I shall die. The agony is so great that I cannot bear it. It was indeed dreadful to look upon him. The froth came from his mouth, and the perspiration poured from his face. Thank heaven he was soon out of pain, and laying him down I returned to my place. Poor fellow, he suffered more for the short time that he was dying than any man I think I ever saw in the same circumstances. I had the curiosity to return and look at him after the battle. A musket ball, I found, had taken him sideways and gone through both groins. Within about half an hour after this I left Sergeant Fraser, and indeed, for the time, had as completely forgotten him as if he had died a hundred years back. The sight of so much bloodshed around will not suffer the mind to dwell too long in any particular casualty. 
even though it happens to one's dearest friend. There was no time either to think for all the action with us rifles just at this moment, and the barrel of my piece was so hot from continual firing that I could hardly bear to touch it, and was obliged to grasp the stock beneath the iron as I continued to blaze away. James Ponton was another crony of mine, a gallant fellow. He had pushed himself in front of me and was checked by one of our officers for his rashness. Keep back, you, Ponton, the lieutenant had said to him more than once. But Ponton was not to be restrained by anything but a bullet when in action. This time, he got one. Which, striking him in the thigh, I suppose hit an artery, for he died quickly. The Frenchman's balls were flying very wickedly at that moment, and I crept up to Ponton and took shelter by lying behind and making a rest for my rifle of his dead body. It strikes me that I revenged his death by the assistance of his carcass. At any rate, I tried my best to hit the enemies hard. After the battle was over, I stepped across to a nearby house in order to see what was going on there. Two or three surgeons also had arrived at this house and were busily engaged in giving their assistance to the wounded. But what struck me most forcibly was that from the circumstance of some wine butts having been left in the apartment and their having in the engagement been perforated by bullets or otherwise broken, the red wine had escaped most plentifully and ran down upon the earthen floor where the wounded were lying so that many of them were soaked in the wine with which their blood was mingled. When the roll was called after the battle, the females who missed their husbands came along in front of the line to inquire of the survivors whether they knew anything about them. Amongst other names, I heard that of Cochran, called in a female voice, without being replied to. The name struck me, and I observed the poor woman who had called it as she stood sobbing before us, and apparently afraid to make further inquiries about her husband. No man had answered to his name or had any account to give of his fate. I myself had observed him fall, as related before while drinking from his canteen, but as I looked at the poor sobbing creature before me, I felt unable to tell her of his death. Captain Leach observed her and called out to the company, Does any man here know what has happened to Cochran? Upon this order I immediately related what I had seen and told the manner of his death. Go then, said the captain, and show the poor woman the spot, as she seemed so desirous of finding the body. I accordingly took my way over the ground we had fought upon, she following and sobbing after me, and, quickly reaching the spot where her husband's body lay, pointed it out to her. It was on the 21st of August that we commenced fighting the Battle of Vimero. The French came down upon us in a column, and the riflemen immediately commenced a sharp fire upon them from whatever they could get a shelter behind, whilst our cannon played upon them. One of our corporals, named Murphy, was the first man in the rifles who was hit that morning, and I remember more particularly remarking the circumstance from his apparently having a premonition of his fate before the battle began. He was usually an active fellow, and up to the time he had shown himself a good and brave soldier, but on this morning he seemed unequal to his duty. And as we had reason to know he was not ordinarily deficient in courage, the circumstance was talked of after the battle was over. He was the first man shot that day. Early on the morning of the battle, I remember being relieved from picket and throwing myself down to gain a few hours sleep before the expected engagement. So wearied was I with watching that I was hardly lying down before I was in a sound sleep. A sleep which those only who have toiled in the field can know. I was not, however, destined to enjoy a very long repose before one of our sergeants, poking me with the muzzle of his rifle, desired me to get up, as many of the men wanted their shoes repaired immediately. This was by no means an uncommon occurrence. On looking around in order to observe if there was any hut or shed in which I could more conveniently exercise my craft, I spied a house near at hand on the rise of a small hill. So I gathered up several pairs of the dilapidated boots and shoes and immediately made for it. Seating myself down in a small room as soon as I entered, I took the tools from my haversack and prepared to work. And as the boots of the captain of my company were amongst the bad lot, and he was barefooted for want of them, I commenced with them. 
Hardly had I worked a quarter of an hour when a cannonball, the first announcement of the coming battle, came crashing through the walls of the house, just above my head, and completely covered the captain's boot as it lay between my knees. There were only two persons in the room at the time, an old and a young woman, and they were so dreadfully scared of this sudden visitation that they ran around the room, making the house echo with their shrieks. For my own part, although I was more used to such sounds, I thought it was no time and place to mend boots and shoes, and so, being thus left alone in my glory, I shook the dust from my apron, gathered up the whole stock in trade from the floor, and hastily replacing my tools in my haversack, followed the example of the mistress of the mansion and her daughter, and bolted out of the house. When I got into the open air, I found all in a state of bustle and activity, the men falling in and the officers busily engaged, while twenty or thirty mouths opened at me the moment I appeared, calling out for their boots and shoes. Where's my boots, Harris, you humbug? Give me my shoes, you old sinner. The captain's boots here, Harris, instantly. Make haste and fall into the ranks as quickly as you can. There was indeed no time for ceremony, so letting go of the corners of my apron, I threw down the whole lot of boots and shoes for the men to choose for themselves. Captain Leach ordered a section of our men to move off at double quick and take possession of a windmill, which was on our left. I was amongst this section and set off full cry towards the mill. When Captain Leach spied and roared out to me by name and return. Hello, you there, Harris, he called. Fall out of that section directly. We want you here, my man. I, therefore, wheeled out of the rank and returned to him. You fall in amongst the men here, Harris. I shall not send you to that post. The cannon will play upon the mill in a few moments like hail. And what shall we do? He continued, laughing, without our head shoemaker to repair our shoes. I myself was very soon so hotly engaged, loading and firing away, enveloped in the smoke I created, and the cloud which hung about me from the continued fire of my comrades, that I could see nothing for a few minutes but the red flash of my own peace amongst the white vapour clinging to my very clothes. This has often seemed to me the very greatest drawback upon our present system of fighting, for whilst in such state on a calm day, until some friendly breeze of wind clears the space around, a soldier knows no more of his position and what is about to happen in his front, or what has happened, than the very dead lying around. Whilst groans and shouts and a noise of cannon and musketry appeared to almost shake the very ground. It seemed hell on earth, I thought. It was just at the close of the Battle of Vimero, the dreadful toil and noise of the engagement had hardly subsided, and I began to look into the faces of the men around me, to see who had escaped the dangers of the hour. Four or five days back I had done the same thing at Rolitha. One feels, indeed, a sort of curiosity to know, after such a scene, who is remaining alive amongst the companions endeared by good conduct, or disliked from bad character during the hardships of the campaign. I saw that the ranks of the riflemen looked very thin. It seemed to me one half had gone down. The battle was just over. A flag of truce had come over from the French. A Frenchman lay close beside me. He was dying and called to me for water. I need not say that I got up and I gave it to him. Whilst I did so, down galloped the Major in front, just in the same good spirits he had been in all day, plunging along, avoiding with some little difficulty the dead and dying, which were strewn about. He was a regular gooden, a real English soldier, and that's better than if he had been the handsomest ladies' man in the army. The Major just now disclosed what none of us, I believe, knew before, namely that his head was as bald as a coot's, and that he had covered the nakedness of his knob up to the present time by a flowing caxon, which, during the heat of the action, had somehow been dislodged, and was lost. A guinea, he kept crying as he rode, to any man who will find my wig. The men, I remember, notwithstanding the sight of the wounded and dead around them, burst into shouts of laughter as he went, and a guinea to any man who will find my wig was the saying amongst us, long after that affair. And here, let me bear testimony to the courage and endurance of that army under trials and hardships such as few armies in any age I should think endured. I have seen officers and men hobbling forward with tears in their eyes from the misery of long miles, empty stomachs and ragged backs, without even shoes or stockings on their bleeding feet, and it was not a little that would bring a tear into the eyes of a rifleman of the peninsula. 
Youths who had not long been removed from their parents' home and care, officers and men have borne hardships and privations such as we have little conception of. And yet these men, faint and weary with toil, would brighten up in a moment when the word ran amongst us that the enemy were at hand.